environmental degradation doesn't go away. The ice caps don't recrystallize, greenhouse gases don't vanish, and deserts don't, by and large, turn into verdant gardens overnight. Environmental degradation affects everyone in the world, whoever you are, wherever you live, and it won't just affect you, it will affect future generations as well, in precisely the same or indeed even worse way. Four things in this speech. A principal justification of this policy, epistemics, political incentives, and finally a little bit on horse trading. So first off, our model. Three things to note about this. The first is we're going to take a representative sample of people from within science. We're not simply going to do a majority vote, we're going to make sure that different viewpoints are represented, but obviously in proportion to the degree to which people believe them. The second thing that we might take a large sample size of scientists to ensure that we're capable of doing this. The second thing that we'll do is if people engage in egregious violations, we will obviously kick them off the panel, but in principle we might well be quite averse to doing that. The final thing is the budgetary constraints. We think we'll probably tie this to a portion of GDP, we'll allow the legislature to vote more money to this where appropriate. We hope that's relatively clear. So, why this policy is in principle justified? Three justifications. The first one is you have no democratic right to decide on behalf of future generations. Recognise the fact that the vast majority of environmental change is unfortunately irreversible. So when you do something now, it has an impact on future people. We say this is categorically different to acquiring things like debt, which can be paid off, because Mr Speaker, the ice caps don't reform. Right? So this is an irreversible change, and one over which we think, and one which we think, it, and one which does affect future generations. That's something we think electorates don't take into account for reasons I will elucidate sec later. Secondly, however, we're happy to jettison the democratic principle, the point at which we achieve better outcomes. Recognise the fact this is something we do under the status quo in a vast er array of areas, including central banking, for instance. So we don't just jettison the democratic principle entirely. Right? We often also, however, on certain issues, accord greater say to particular people. So, for instance, on the basis of location, on local issues. So we think it's important to recognise the fact that we're happy to allocate a bigger sale on certain issues to people who are in a better position to make decisions as we do on local issues, as we do, for instance, in the United States Senate. And we think this is entirely consistent with that principle. The final thing to note is that these sorts of issues are transnational. We don't think national electorates take this into account. We think elected experts will do so because we will put it in their mandate. So. Three things. Things. First off, let's talk about epistemics. I'm going to give you a couple of mechanisms here. So the first off is understanding science requires scientific knowledge. Unfortunately, this is something that a large number of, of politicians do not have. Importantly, they can't just go and ask someone, right? Because they're not more, these issues are a lot more complicated than that. They're often interrelated to a whole host of other issues, and you just need to ask too many people than you realistically have time to when you're responsible for considering a whole host of different issues and have a whole host of different responsibilities. But moreover, we say more often than not, politicians have an incentive not to do so. Because when they consult the scientists, and the scientist tells them what the right thing to do is, that constrains their own authority and capacity to do what was expedient for them to do politically in the first place. Secondly, however, in reconciling scientific disputes, which we recognise is quite common, right, you need statistical knowledge that these people simply paradigmatically do not have, right? Science is empirical by definition, and as such, the degree to which scientific phenomena are A, present, or B, like, extensive, right, is contingent upon an analysis of the actual empirical goings on. Very often this requires an intense understanding of statistics that the vast majority of these scientists can't have. And let me tell you how he studied it for five years, can't get in a reasonable period of time, right? Because they're not able to adjudicate on scientific questions. A good example here, right, be on the Antarctic ice caps melting. This is an important question to understand because it tells you the extent to which this is a problem and the extent to which you need to engage in policy to mitigate this. The point at which the questions here are to do with intensity of certain studies and the way in which statistics are employed within them. These are things that realistically these people can't adjudicate on. Finally, we tell you that these people are very fickle right, compared to experts. One point of data is likely to change their opinion of a great deal because they didn't have that many to begin with. Contrast that with an expert who has acquired a lot of data and thus as much as likely to be thrown by one piece of information as happened with the rate of uh, melting of the Antarctic ice caps. Secondly, we tell you they have much better incentives as experts than politicians do. Why so? One, politicians have a short-termist political incentive. They want to be doing as well as they possibly can in the polls to maintain their stature. They're often caught on really short-term election cycles, which contrast massively with the very long-term timescale that is required to understand the environment. But secondly, we tell you they have huge incentives to particular individuals through the need for donations. Recognise the fact that, unfortunately, political campaigning is a high capital intensive exercise. It requires lots of money to do collective action, advertising, and all the rest of it, right? Like being an expert doesn't require the same amount of capital, it requires bread and a place to live, right? So on the comparative, these people have much more of a need for donations, that's much more easily got at by an individual who would have an intentive to skew the political system. Campaign finance is not an option here because it requires vastly more political capital than is implicit in this policy, and moreover, has been hitherto unachievable effectively in literally every jurisdiction I can think of, and I can think of all 192. Finally, we point out that you know, like at the end of the day, the political incentives, the 
have are by and large domestic issues. We care more about their national interests than global interests. So insofar as these are global issues, we think not giving them to electorates or politicians who have purely national incentives is a much better course of action. I'll take you now closing. Yeah, Ashish. Um, future generations don't exist and has, as of yet, not expressed any opinions. Uh, what about this panel lets them speak yeah, yeah, Ashish, 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 they will and they want somewhere to live, right? <laughs> they would also like it if they have somewhere to grow crops so that they can eat, right? We think these are relatively intuitive principles. We're having to make presumptions on this basis. Thirdly, we tell you that the environment is incommensurable with other issues. The degree of political force training that occurs around this issue is hugely inappropriate. Why so? One, because environmental change is irreversible in a way that anthropogenic change is not by definition, because it is not by and large anthropogenic, or at the very least there is a natural element within it that human beings have a limited degree of control over. But secondly, because its impacts are just so hard to understand, it's so chaotic, right? But the environment is a chaotic system, so a small change now in the starting conditions can have a huge impact much further down the line, right? At the point at which, right, we engaging changes that are really very hard to understand in the future and could have potentially huge ramifications and we can't pull back on, we would suggest that this is an issue that is very hard to weigh up against the <coughs> Unfortunately, seeing as environmental issues are not inaturally determinative, that weighing up is something that happens literally all the time. Environmental policy gets put on the back burner or traded between parties so they can get aims on things that give them more short-term political gratification, such as you know short-term economic policies or a bit of pork barrel spending. What we would suggest is that this is an issue of an importance that simply that means it cannot be illustrated. Experts have a mandate to deal solely with the environment. They're not going to weigh it up against these things with which it is fundamentally incommensurable and trade it for cheap political favours that increase their poll ratings for a couple of months. At the end of the day, we don't care about democracy if it achieves worse outcomes for people today, people around the world, and people tomorrow. We think our policy does much better for all of those groups, and on that basis, we're exceptionally <coughs> proud to stand in proposition. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in the last speech, the principle that we heard is that democracy, or that, we're, that they are willing to throw out democracy to achieve better outcomes. Unfortunately, I don't think they actually justified why they get better outcomes other than a glib response that people want somewhere to live. The reality is, when a government has a budget, there are necessarily going to be value trade-offs that governments have to make. We think that, yes, while it might seem better if we had more money to spend on environmental policy, that's not the reality of the situation that we're dealing with here. In order for, to you, for us to have more environmental policy, we'd have to necessarily take away funding from something else. And I think that value judgment can only be made in a democratic system. So what I want to do first is talk about the philosophy of government and the role of government, and why we think it's important to have a democratic, uh, a democratic system. And the second thing that I want to talk about is why we don't think this is the best means of solving environmental problems, and why we think that environmental problems can actually be solved by just uh, continuing the status quo. Uh, and then I'll get on to rebuttal uh, after that. So the first thing I want to talk about again is the philosophy of government uh, and the role of government. So we think that the government exists to maximize the interests of the underlying people that it represents. The only way to understand what those interests are is to have some sort of political will and mechanism to sum up that political will to decide what people actually want or what people value in a society. So I think that the justification that they give in order to have more environmental regulation is this notion of future rights, that there are going to be future generations, and those generations deserve protection. So first of all, I don't think they've justified future rights other than that these people might exist. I think that it, you have to be able to express some sort of interest or some sort of preference in order for those rights to be respected. But furthermore, given that it's unclear what value judgment future generations would make in the same situation, I don't think you can just assume that they would make the assume that they would make the decision uh, uh, to, to to have more environmental regulation. So to give you an example, I think that something like socialized health care or Obamacare recently passed in the United States, which is a huge uh, increase in the, in, the, in the federal budget, would not be possible in a situation where this policy was implemented, if this was implemented right before, for example. And I think that's the type of value judgment that we're talking about. It's not like 
not having a place to live versus nothing. It's having not having a place to live versus better health care for people on the ground. I just don't think there's a right answer to that question. And I don't think there's a right answer that people have either. And I, think, uh, I don't think that, that everyone is going to agree on, on the right answer to that question. The only mechanism in which we can actually just, uh, find out how people feel about this issue, the only mechanism we can decide what the right value is, is through a democratic system. So why are like, parliaments and legislatures particularly good at deciding what the best value is? So first of all, we think that um, the like notion of compromise uh, is, is an effective way to sum up political will. So the trade-off to happen in Congress. I know everyone likes to uh, think that legislatures are just inefficient and you know all campaign finance. I'll get to that in the rebuttal. But I do think they're actually pretty good at representing their underlying populations. Their incentives are they want to get elected, and I actually think this is a good thing because the way they're able to get reelected is by representing the interests of their underlying population. So to that end, they're able to actually effectively sum up the political will and. Uh, uh, no, no, thank you. So the political will and come up with uh, and come up with the, the, the value judgment that the underlying population wants. So what is the role of science in all this? We think the role of science and other expert testimony is to provide information to those politicians and then have the politicians weigh that against the value judgments that society is making. And I think that's the important part. Uh, I think that, that's the important part. Like we get this argument from the, uh, the opening half. No, thank you. We get this argument from the last speech that science is really complicated because science is really complicated. We should trust politicians to make decisions about science. I think everything is really complicated to a certain extent. And that's why we have things like in Congress, we have congressional testimony. And I'm assuming in Parliament they have the same thing, where they actually get information, are able to look at the information in the best way, and like, uh, maybe, uh, look at the information and, and, and actually make the best decision, sure. Under this policy, publics and politicians still get to choose the value judgment about how much they want to spend on environmental policy. The relevant comparison is, should Obama be the one that implements the Affordable Care Act's technology aspects or the complicated aspects of the policy? So, okay, so a couple of things here. If that's going to be the model you're, def you're either having no efficacy or you're not going to, uh, or you're violating democratic principles. Because if your new model is you're going to actually have Congress decide the budget every year, then the political will is decide there's not going to be a very there's not going to be a very big budget. I don't think you can like have it both ways. You have to bite one of the harms. I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, no, I'll take opening half. Um, so we did work the point is trade-offs happen within environmental policy, right? So I get something in my district if you turn down these regulations on these big polluters, right? We think those trade-offs are not legitimate. They're made on political grounds. They ought to be made on the grounds of the general utility, which is something these people are best equipped to assess. Yes, I just don't think that, that those trade-offs are illegitimate. I think that uh, you, you haven't made an argument why general utility is better. I think that oftentimes those local projects, which we like to say uh, just aren't important, employ a lot of people in districts, are actually good for the livelihood of, 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 of the people who the government is supposed to serve. So I know it's like very popular to just sort of glibly say uh, pork barrel spending is bad, like trade-offs are bad, I actually think they're a good thing, and that's what we're defending on our side of the house. So, uh, but, so, so I, I think that uh, because, there, again, there's necessarily budget constraints, these value judgments need to occur in the legislature. The second thing, though, is we don't think this is actually the best means of solving environmental problems. So I think what they're talking about is that this is fundamentally a factual question, that right now, the political will doesn't exist to have more environmental politics. So if you buy their argumentation that for some reason like environmental policies are just a good thing to have in society, I think this notion of people not respecting science is quickly like dying out. Like it's generally, generally young people put more faith in science, generally young people value science a little bit more. I think this actually stifles that process though, because if for example, you are taxed more or you lose a social service as a result of scientific bodies making some decision, you are less likely to place faith in science in the future. So one, I think that if they're going to have this new closing half model that they get to decide the budget every year, that's definitely going to drive down the budget. But secondly, I also think it's the case that there's going to have other spillover effects because sometimes people have like mono, view science as like a monolithic entity. So like things like vaccine deniers, etc. If you don't value science as an institution, there are actually harms that occur from not valuing science, which I think is a problem for them. So a couple of things I want to hit on rebuttal real quickly. I think I covered most of it in substantive. Is uh, that there's no uh, uh, that there's like all these short-term incentives and this uh, campaign finance argument. So look, I think that we can defend that like campaign finance might not be always good, but we can also defend that campaign finance can be a useful democratic tool for summing up political will as well. Lastly, on this domestic versus global issue, I don't think they've ever justified why 
governments should care about the citizens of global people beyond their own interests or value them more, uh, value them more over their other citizens. I think they're going to need to do a lot more work to actually prove that instead of just saying it. For these reasons, we're very proud to propose. Um, can you give us an outline of the 
but just an example of a policy that they might have. Okay, so things that they won't enact will be policies that increase the, the level of greenhouse emissions. They're going to do things like sign up to Kyoto, do things like sign, uh, pushing through environmental change, placing uh, clean air restrictions, do all sorts of things to improve these places. A lot of these, the vast majority of the point is, are incredibly uncontroversial. We do know in the vast majority of cases what is good for the environment. Yeah, there may be a few cases at the margins where there's a disagreement and there may be some incommensurability of value, but the vast majority are just clear-cut cases where Putting like bad things into the air lead to bad things to happen, and any idiot can tell you that. So, why are experts then better placed than politicians to make these determinations? Yes, Nick. Given, given the backlash that will occur as a result of this policy, don't you think political will will lower funding for environmental policies even below the status quo? Nick, as I told you, the backlash comes when politicians are able to politicise this issue. But the point where politicians have no clout. They're emasculated. They're not able to do that because there's no political capital to do so. So, experts versus politicians. We said, and Michael told you, that increasingly independent, better, like, aware people who are able to make long-term decisions and would be perceived as such were better placed to make these adjudications. The problems were, well, even if you had well-meaning politicians, the problem was that they could be accused of partisanship, right? They could be accused of being in the pay of one lobby or the other. It was very hard to disprove those claims because often, um, often, often it was hard to falsify them. Moreover, what we said was that even in instances, so we, we said experts actually were able to escape that, right? They were able to paint themselves as being independent, being a bit, being above the fray of, of, um, of political discourse. We think that allows people to actually, it's more likely that actually they're able to convince people this is something that they want to get on board with. They're no longer seeing it as the muckraking of politics. We, we, get a, we get a high quality of debate that doesn't involve mudslinging. Moreover, what we say under experts is that they're not reduced to horse trade. And this is crucial because often environmental issues are not electorally determinative. Right? Nobody goes out and in a campaign and says, oh, I'm just going to do green air, do, do, like, do green issues and just forget about the economy. That would be a ridiculous stance to take. Most politicians relegate it on the agenda, but these environmental experts will not do that in the majority of cases. The reason being because it's their sole mandate. It's what they care about and it's what they're enormously invested in, which means they're not going to allow themselves to be pushed around or bullied. So when politicians just relegate these issues down the agenda, these experts won't allow that to happen. They'll ensure that budget remains intact, ensure it gets spent on the best things. The final issue in this debate is why politicians don't just consult experts. Firstly, because it's never happened. But three more, uh, three more justifications. The first thing is politicians don't like to consult experts because it limits their power. It limits their authority to make decisions and the scope they have for, um, for increasing their personal power. Secondly, we think politicians often don't do so because it's time consuming. They want to make quick, rapid decisions because they look good in the public eye. And thirdly, what we claim is that these issues are not electorally determined and they have very little incentive to start asking people and wasting the precious time when these issues aren't going to gain them enormous numbers of votes. At the end of the day, we can't leave this to politicians. We need, uh, we need accountable. We need people with distance and impartiality to make fair decisions that don't just help people in your state, but help people far away who need our help too. For these reasons, we're very proud to propose. I thank that speaker very much for his remarks, and this House now pleased to welcome the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, in what world are people really going to see these scientists as being more objective and having less of an incentive to distort the truth in a world where they have absolute, unelected, unaccountable authority? <laughs> Look, we tried to be generous and not let them defend the Congress or the Parliament setting the budget every year for this system. Because in that world, they're not only not having an improvement, but clearly making this actively worse. We think on their side of the House, the incentive for the politicians is going to be simple. People don't like giving lots of power to people who aren't elected. They like having control of the money that they give to the government. And similarly, politicians like having control of the money that is given to them as well. The incentive on their side of the House is quite simple. If you are a congressperson or someone in parliament, you take this organization as soon as possible, giving it less money than we already give to the kind of budgetary endeavors that we think we have. The United States, probably one of the worst nations in this regard, gives billions of dollars to the Environmental Protection Agency every single year. But a similar organization run by unelected people who are not accountable, who are seen as the crazy scientists that Newt Gingrich now all of a sudden can easily peddle as being crazy.
cracks, because by peddling that they are cracks, he appeals to the very beliefs that these individuals have, that these people are essentially trying to control their lives with a big brother government. I think it is quite clear in which world we have a better protection for the environment, more money going to these causes, and better policy. Because the failure on their side of the house is to recognize that just because something is scientific doesn't mean that it isn't political. The rejection on their side of the house of the idea that something can be both scientific and political when someone has direct political interests is a serious problem for them, and why their system makes it clearly worse than even the current systems that we have that we think are often ineffective. Before I move on to why we think our side of the house will be more effective in the long term, I'll take closer. Do you think that majorities should be able to vote so that so as not to recognize the human rights of a minority? Look, I think we might sometimes be willing to put constraints on democracy when we think that there are extreme things at stake. But I think what needs to be illustrated on their side of the house is why something so extreme in this case is so obvious that need to be made. But we think the difference is that it's not so clear and extreme and obvious what the right environmental policies are. And it's not the case that these people will put them in place in any given circumstance, especially if they have no money, because that's what we've already articulated will actually happen if you believe your value on your side of the house. Because we think it's not so simple. It's a trade-off. Whether or not you have an additional inch of sea level or lower of sea level versus whether or not you have the unemployment rate up or down 1% is a difficult decision. I don't think there's a right answer to that question, even if it's an answer that would make these guys happier on their side of the house. The economic rights of your own citizens might very well outweigh that harms of having that additional inch of sea level or additional two inches of sea level, and the people who are best equipped at making that value judgment, because it is a value judgment, it is not an objective scientific fact, are no ones. So. We think everyone has equal say in that particular kind of value judgment, which they fail to recognize on their side of the house. No, thank you. I'll take you a little bit later. Look, what we see on our side of the house is a quite clear simple system. One that what people do is, over time, they evolve their political beliefs to match the scientific ones. It just isn't the case that people believe scientific falsehoods from 500 years ago. It isn't the case that people articulate or believe that the United States should enact X or Y global policy because the world is flat. Look, we recognize that these things take time, but I don't think that that's something that's a particularly significant problem in this particular case. It's not the case that we're turning on a dime with regards to environmental regulations, and if we don't decide to make the right policy tomorrow, the entire world will be sunk under a sea. We think what people will ultimately do in the long term is actually recognize what the right environmental policies are and support them, perhaps. But we think ultimately the issue is that the right environmental policies, when considering all the other trade-offs that have to be made in a society, has to be selected by the democracy in order to be correct and can't be imposed by some sort of governmental agency on their side. Go ahead, I'll take it. Well, that temperature and that sea level rises for people all over the world, some of whom are among the world's very poorest and those least capable of defending themselves against that attack. Why do you deny them any representation at all on a solely nationalistic policy basis? So I think we make two mistakes with Thor's argument. The first is without ever justifying why it's the case that these interests should override the economic interests or economic rights of people within this own country, because we think that there are trade-offs in this area. And secondly, recognizing that the international impacts of the arguments I've already illustrated with regards to not believing in climate science are also there as well. Because when the United States has this policy and American climatologists do basically have a reason to be disbelieved. People who observe American climatology all across the globe will believe it less and will be less likely to implement policies that are accurate using this kind of climate change technology, climate science as well. So we think the actual impact at this point is because people believe in science less, that's also a global impact that negatively affects whether or not you actually get the kind of environmental policy that they want on their side of the house as well. I don't think it's so clear and obvious, again, how you should make the value judgment between your own citizens and the citizens of another country. I do think that that's something that a democracy has to do and that can't be left up to a scientific body that, again, has no privileged position on normative or ethical issues. I think given all this, it's quite clear exactly on which side of the house we have better protection of the environment in the long term. No thank you. And I think that's why it's exactly the case and we think this is so important. But I feel to recognize is that climate change isn't just a government decision to sign a Kyoto Protocol or not sign a Kyoto Protocol. It's your and my decision to cycle. To, to recycle, excuse me, to, to cycle too, probably, as opposed to driving a car. But it's also our decision to, for example, drive an SUV versus driving a sedan, buying a Tesla. These are the kinds of decisions that won't be made on their side of the house when people don't believe in climate science, if you think as an additional pernicious impact beyond the ones we've already talked about on the political level. The actual impacts of the environment are going to be negative on their side of the house because people are going to be less likely to perceive the scientists as legitimate because they perceive the political realities that are true for every individual. That when you have the ability to get more power for yourself by exaggerating scientific fact, then this is something that people will fear. Maybe it will be true, maybe it won't. These people are not saints, they're just scientists. But regardless, it will clearly be the case that it will negatively impact what people believe about climate change, which is the significant pernicious impacts if you're really allowing Congress to set the budget every single year. I think given that, that clearly establishes our positive standpoint and why I think it's quite clear we're winning on that ground, both in our philosophy of democracy and the practical value that they're trying to achieve. But I want to go into some deep rebuttal on some of the issues that they've talked about as well. Uh, no, thank you. So what we think we fail to do, they fail to do on their side of the house is recognize that a lot of the problems they talk about are problems about a system being undemocratic. The problem is campaign finance. Get rid of 
campaign finance laws that allow people to give billions of dollars and don't make Supreme Court decisions like the United States just did. Look, I think it's quite clear that if the issues are the country isn't democratic enough, making policies that make the country more democratic will solve these issues. And we do think that ultimately the democratic consensus will support having environmental policies that are actually good in the long run. Why do we think this is the case? Because I think essentially there are four justifications, they're all essentially reasons, why it might be in a politician's short-term interest to oppose environmental regulations. But we think it's quite clear they're in their long-term economic and political interests to support these kind of regulations when ultimately people believe the science that we think that they are more likely to do on our side of the house. What people are likely to do is propose and enact local restrictions on, for example, clean air laws, which we think is something that's being observed in a lot of jurisdictions in the United States that would be less likely on their side of the house. We observe that people will be actually likely to listen to these scientists when it is the case that they are supported by the public. Because the problem on their side of the house is one of legitimacy. When the government action is viewed as illegitimate, when the scientists who propose it and do it are viewed as illegitimate by a greater portion of society, it's clear that it will politically impact the system that they are trying to establish. And more importantly, how it will impact the environment, the very value that they consider on their side of the house. And for all those reasons, we are very proud of the folks. We thank Dr. Peter very much for his remarks. And this house now pleased to welcome the member of government to continue the case for the entire government bench. Mr. Speaker, what hasn't really been acknowledged by the team so far in this debate is truly the magnitude of the threat that we're facing. This is a threat like nothing we have ever faced before. It came about rapidly. It is going to fundamentally uproot the very foundations of our economy. And it is going to have to, in order to combat it, displace some of the most capitalized elite members of our community who have an active incentive and a capacity to be able to fight against it. Let's be very, very clear. The world is in peril from climate change, and the suggestion that some jobs in some electorate as a result of some pork barreling means that this is a time for compromise is truly bizarre. The sea levels are going to rise no matter what we do. The question is, are we going to act to mitigate the types of devastating effects that are killing people now and will kill people in extreme weather events over the next 100, 200, or 500 years if we manage to live that long? So, let's recognise that in light of that urgent, catastrophic threat that has never been faced by the human race before, democracy is a pretty terrible way to respond. We use democracy to keep a check on the most egregious successes of elite and powerful. But mostly, we defer to representatives, we give them long terms in power, we have very large bureaucracies, and when we do have discussions about politics, we basically agree that we want the person who's going to work for jobs or working families, and then have a very narrow set of disputes about whether or not one policy or another is going to do it. We actually don't do much democracy on the planet at the moment. Most of the time we just have it there to keep the bastards honest. In this case though, what we have is democracy enabling the very excess and corruption and devastating consequences that it was designed to prevent. It would be truly farcical if we didn't do something about it. What we are seeing is systemic corruption of the political discourse and the way in which people view and understand environmental politics. Let me explain that. There was a consensus about climate change, there was a consensus about global warming, and there was strong political impetus to start dealing with it. The European Union started to put in place a carbon trading scheme, Barack Obama ran and was successful on a campaign of cap and trade, Australia had a carbon tax put in place, and what happened? The, the interests that saw that that was a threat to their profits acted. They scuttled the Copenhagen Climate Conference, they scuttled the Mexican Climate Conference, and have moved systemically to increase the amount of doubt about climate science. Climate change denial is at an all-time high, especially amongst young conservative people. We think this is incredibly important to recognise. That rejection of science that the opening opposition is so worried about has occurred, and it's signing our ability to be able to get those results. I'm going to tell you how that's happened and why it's happened. One of the key reasons why is because the oil, energy, manufacturing, basically all of the economy that uses energy, so the economy, has a huge incentive to stop action on climate change because it impairs their profit motive. But perniciously, they have a huge capacity to be able to stop that change. Why is that? Because we are talking about some of the highest margin industries on Earth. ExxonMobil and other oil companies are the most profitable companies on the planet. They're the largest, they're the oldest with the most accumulated capital, but they have established and skilled lobbyists that are very good at avoiding environmental regulation and stymieing that process because they've been doing it for many, many years. 
The problem is, this has come at the same time as a breakdown of power in the, as, of media gatekeepers that might previously have been able to negotiate that conversation, but where we don't have established players within the media market who can kind of reach down and make sure that it's user heard in a way that they were before. You get a dissemination of a polity, political understanding and discourse that no longer comes through those channels and happens between people on Twitter and Facebook and social media and bloggers on sites you can't easily check the credibility of, where there's such a volume and a, and a quick news cycle that means your capacity to be able to understand those facts and research them is lowering. But one of the other important factors that's existing at the same time is a great recession that has thrown the world's biggest economies into like economic devastation. And it's going to have one of the slowest recoveries ever seen from a recession that big. And in light of that, there is a huge capacity of these money interests to create a huge amount of false doubt about the science. Because the public wants to be blissful on this. They want to hear that it's not a problem. Because that's the only way they can reconcile their short-term interests with the reality that we are heading towards an apocalypse if we do not act. And it's complex, and they are on the side of the interim. It's the wait-and-see approach. The wait-and-see approach that we simply cannot afford. We didn't know that this has happened before. The very same human beings that were involved in slowing and creating doubt about tobacco's health consequences are the very same human beings that are leading the climate change denial movement. Not the same lobby group, not the same corporation, the same people. They went and recruited the scientists that effectively created doubt and slowed the process of consensus about the health effects of tobacco. We eventually conquered that. We don't have time to eventually, over the course of the next 50 years, try and undo that climate change denial. We simply do not have time. What's also happening at the same time as that is these corporations are buying up and warehousing patents on green technology that hamper the capacity of competitors to those markets to be able to viably compete with it is occurring. Banning that or banning the kind of intervention and, and creation of false lobbying groups would be a great policy to enact, one that would be very cheap and very effective, one that we imagine our panel of scientists would probably do on day one. The problem with the suggestion that we just have campaign finance reform firstly ignores all of that kind of issues-based competitiveness that I've just described to you, but also campaign finance reform is itself hampered by political corruption in donations where there's an incentive to design systems that don't truly compare it to. I'll take closing. Given that open government tells us that this panel is going to be made up of different opinions according to what the majority scientific opinion is, don't you incentivize businesses to now fund loads of anti-climate change research so we change the consensus on this panel? Yeah, like we, we saw that one coming, so we're going to deal with that in a bit more detail. But the, like the key gist of it will be that we'll apply like a very strict test on what counts as a scientist. We'll probably like have peer review and size things and institutional requirements. Um, but Sway will give that more detail. So. We were really curious that the example that the opening opposition comes up with here as a success story for political reform is socialised healthcare. Like, it took one of the biggest countries on the planet like, more than 50 years to come to the realisation that every other OECD country had that it's probably a worthwhile thing to do to make sure that people didn't die and suffer in the hospitals if they couldn't afford healthcare. That's the type of suffering and slow change that we can't afford in this environment. We don't need a mechanism to determine the values of people in this instance. It's survival. We know what their value is. We know what they want to prioritise. It's not a time for compromise. That compromise will kill us. As I said, we simply do not have time to go through the same process of undoing the doubt that's been created that we had to do on tobacco. We don't have time to fight the HMOs like we to some extent managed to do when we fought them on Obamacare. What we need is a trustworthy, competent alternative. Scientists that are immune from that corruption have no vested interest other than to avoid those catastrophic consequences and have the knowledge and skills to understand and refrain from that doubt corruption. And we think to answer the question, they'll probably implement, in addition to the policies I've already discussed, an emissions trading scheme at a very high rate, and that will probably solve the problem. We thank that speaker very much for his remarks. This House now pleased to welcome the member of the opposition to continue the case for the entire opposition bench. So this debate is about the kind of inputs that we think are valuable that go into making these sorts of policy decisions. We are not averse on our side to consulting experts on the exact results of what implementation of a particular policy will mean. What we do claim, however, is that these decisions are never purely technocratic. They involve moral claims that are at best tenuous and we need a democratic process to decide them. Three things on extension. Firstly, why these are never morally neutral 
purely technocratic decisions. Secondly, why this policy will actually lead to worse environmental policy being enacted on the ground and being undertaken. Why, if Chris truly cares about people dying, more people die in his world. Lastly, why we think discourse and democratic mechanisms are better. Before that, rebuttal. So Chris tells us, you know, climate change is a catastrophic threat like nothing humanity has ever faced in its entire history. And apparently, we can't tell people that. Apparently, the fact that billions of people in the future are going to die is a fact we cannot communicate to people who are currently still alive. I find that claim deeply mystifying. If Chris is that persuaded, I'm not sure why the average Joe possesses some kind of like moral defect that Chris does not possess, such that they cannot understand that billions of people dying is a bad thing. But okay, the fact that many people don't buy that logic, don't think that we should sacrifice so much for the future generations, Maybe people's moral intuitions, by and large, tend to point in favour of helping people in moral proximity to them. Like people within your same state, like people who are close to you, like people who are not going to exist in some undefined form many generations into the future. The fact that lots of people's moral intuitions point in that direction signals to me that we probably should have a discussion about what that means, right? Unless they're going to come up with some absolute utilitarian idea of how the world works. And I look forward to hearing a defence of absolute utilitarianism coming out from there. I think the distributional effects that we ought to have some kind of discussion about. Chris said, well, we used to propose cap and trading schemes and all these things, and then they all disappeared. Yeah, several reasons. One, there was a financial crisis. Like, I mean, probably we were worried about other things as well, in a way that was not totally illegitimate, right? Like, in the long run, we are all dead. It's reasonable to say that we want to preserve people's lives now, because that's a good way of ensuring that people in the future exist. But secondly, what we also say is that the reason why cabin trading schemes disappear is because we realise that most of the proposals were fairly crap. For instance, they allowed the rich countries to buy as many permits as they wanted and then pollute. And if evidence suggests that concentrated pollution has exponentially more damage than diffused pollution, then it's something we should not do. So it's extremely unclear why his characterization that there was a vast movement towards environmental policy that just disappeared did not happen for valid reasons, even under his own metric in the first place. So thank you. Then he says, well, we do want to, we want to depoliticize this. We want to ensure that you know, like horrible companies don't get to manipulate this. Firstly, like given that your action is going to cause massive political outcry, but let's say, like, let's say in the American populace who are not used to being told that environmental policy now trumps the constitution in terms of how little say they have over it, I suspect they might be upset. I think this might motivate people who don't like environmental policy to campaign a lot harder to just restrict the exact same budget that, as they themselves pointed out in the POI, they think people can restrict. You can have a hundred brilliant experts using an incredibly small budget to do nothing effective at all. And I think that's what the actual deliberative effect is going to be. No, thank you. Furthermore, right, you say, oh, we should check these scientists so that they have good, like, you know, uh, legitimate scientific credentials. Yes, lots of them get credentials from the American Association of Petrochemical Engineers, funded by ExxonMobil, right? Like, lots of these people will still be on your panel. You can't say that we are going to decide what science is if you want to, in the first place, have a technocratic panel, right? If you're going to decide what science is in the first place, and then choose people who agree that put in your panel, I think the logic is about upside down. Uh, open it up, yeah. In politics, horse trading often displaces complex philosophical debate about commensurability, which is why we're happy to do this and consider it legitimate in lots of other areas for such as monetary policy, which is similarly complex. Okay, so two things. Number one, you concentrate the horse trading re budgets. Secondly, horse trading at least does not totally shut down all moral discourse that people have, right? At the end of the day, people still get a vote. No matter how much funding you give to a politician to act in other interests, if these interests are that important, people still get a vote. I'm happy to stay on the comparative read with that. Firstly, therefore, why this is never going to be a morally neutral position. The first, as has been pointed out, is it involves future generations, and it's uncertain to, to what extent that they have claims on us. Probably most people think they have some kind of claim on a moral conscience. But the claim is, to what extent should we sacrifice people living right now for their interests in the future? If most people, in fact, have moral intuitions that point out, maybe that's not important. We think we ought to have a discussion about that. But secondly, often environmental policy issues uniquely distributionally affect certain groups more than others. For instance, the poor are often the first people to be negatively affected by certain kinds of environmental policies yes. that are put in power. What do I mean? For instance, the imposition of low emission zones, right, that tax people who use cars in a certain region or who use particularly high emission fuels often means that poor people who can't transition easily are uniquely affected. No, thank you, right? I think the fact society might choose to decide that the fact that vulnerable groups in their own country are being affected more by this than anyone else in the world is something they want to take into account. Thirdly, it's unclear to me why nations have obligations to other citizens. Every time we choose not to intervene, billions of people die. Every action a state takes means actions they didn't take saving someone anywhere else. Even if the consequence that people decide 
countries shouldn't care about what happens in other nations. I think that is legitimate for them to make, right? Nations owe obligations to the citizens, first of all, because you vote for them and you control them in a way that you don't control anyone else in the world. So we don't think it's prima facie illegitimate that we prioritize these things. Secondly, though, know, why do you get that policy on the ground? No thanks. The first is that, to a very large extent, successful environmental policy is not about passing laws, but about persuading people to change the way in which they behave in the real world, right? the kind of products they consume, the way in which they live their lives. No, thank you. In order to do that, we need to have genuine buy-in, not on the fact of climate change alone, but on the trade-offs and sacrifices you demand of individual people. No, thank you. Telling individuals that this is a decision over which they have absolutely no control, telling these people that climate policy is something of which they have especially little say, is a bad way to persuade people, which is, even when it's very difficult in the status quo, to change the way in which they live their lives in order to do these sorts of things. At the point at which you can't implement a law criminalizing people who live polluted lifestyles, we think you're actually losing capacity to change the way in which people behave. But we also think democracies are good at settling these sorts of issues because they pointed out these things are complex and technocratic. Yes, you can tell people that these things are complex, right? People are often quite happy to defer to authority in a status quo. The claim that 99% of scientists support the existence of man-made climate change has been quite persuasive to quite a large number of individuals. Often people decide on broad policy stances which involve arguments they can indeed access. For instance, I think my country should prioritize nuclear energy over wind energy because of the fact that we don't have very much wind. Seems to me the sort of discussion that an ordinary person without very much scientific knowledge can have, that, but the details of which can still be informed by people acting in a technocratic way. It's not the case that politicians are immune from all kinds of experts who advise them on these policies, right? The difference is we have more input from a larger number of people who are directly affected, that means we get better decisions. And even on a comparative about distortion, they get more of it in their world anyway. For all these reasons, I'm extremely proud to oppose this motion. We thank those for your very much for his remarks and welcome the final speaker on the government bench, the government whip. Mr. Speaker, when this great nation saved the world from fascism in World War II, they didn't conduct a straw poll, they went against the democratic will, they basically created a war cabinet and did what needed to be done to save the world from imminent peril. That's the kind of peril we face today. And we think that what we're functionally doing here is creating a council of generals, in this case science, scientists, in order to implement a solution that we think will save humankind. First, I want to look at whether this is principally something we need to do in a time of great urgency, and practically whether we'd achieve it in that time frame, and whether they would achieve it in that time frame. So first of all, the principal question here. And we look first of all at this kind of opening half clash about the informational incentives. Now, we are, we are not claiming, Ashish, on the government bench that people literally cannot have information communicated to them. What we're saying is they have lots of biases when they assess that information, and he gave a good example of one. But like you're looking at the economic figures right now and using that to decide this kind of policy that will imperil us economically much more in the future because an economy is dependent on a functioning environment. So that's a kind of bias about short term, long term. People are biased in an optimistic way such that they don't necessarily trust the most accurate information but the most optimistic information. There was another bias in the opening half of this debate that was discussed, and that was that of parochialism. And the opposition said, well, maybe you know you want to help your neighbour before you help those overseas. But I I gave the example of rights in this debate, the point of information, which I think is a good one, where we have a doctrine of human rights, where we might want to prioritise the concern of those around us, but we have a universal and global interest that transcends parochial interests in order to defend things that threaten and imperil life. That point of information was a really important concession from the opposition bench, because it said they required a crisis or an emergency. That conveniently was Chris's extension. Why this is an emergency of such a short period that we can't allow the slow wheels of democracy to uh, eventually arrive at a solution that, that might operate? Because as I gave in the example of the introduction, you can't allow uh, you know, global warming to take control of the world, to have absolutely irreversible effects. I mean, we've left it so late now that even if we start uh, dropping the amount of carbon emissions, we're still going to feel lots of the effects of global warming that will bring widespread economic and political devastation. The opposition said, well, it's a trade-off between like a few inches of sea rising and a little bit of economic, uh, you know, a decrease in, in the, the growth of an economy. 
But a few inches of sea level rising could be cataclysmic for nations around the world, like Bangladesh that has hundreds of millions of people, well, over 100 million people that could end up under water. We also think there's an economic effect to that, and you're all your future ability to access all your political rights. The opposition talked about future generations. Our extension was people living today who are going to suffer the consequences politically and economically from global warming. Opening. You, all of your arguments presume that you're getting more funding for environmental regulation given that Chris's entire extension was about why politicians and the people don't want to fund this, aren't you actively reducing funding from the status quo and making things worse? Okay, Congress can reduce the budget for global warming as much as it likes because a carbon tax is revenue neutral. A carbon tax creates money for the government. So even if you have this kind of tricksy way of like giving them $10 to work with to fight global warming, we think these scientists are creative enough to come up with solutions that we think will be effective. We think this crisis because it's likely that nations are going to be underwater in the next few decades based on the information that has been available for us for a long time, the information people have been discounting, avoiding and ignoring, means that that means that we can suspend what was uh, the general instrumental and quite weak value of democracy. I mean, there's been enough US bashing in this debate, so let's take the case of the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, every five years, they get together to elect one of their houses by a stupid, disproportionate, first-past-the-post system. That's such a weak form of accessing all of these complicated preferences. But also, five years in a democracy uh, imperiled by global warming is a really long time to let people catch up to the preferences they need to act upon to solve global warming. Let's now look at this question of uh, you know, the, the practice in, in, in this debate, how we're gonna bring about better change. They said that you're not gonna get legitimation under our system. No one's going to trust these panel scientists. We think declaring a state of emergency is a good way of getting people to rally around the cause of global warming. But even if that weren't true, we think political legitimation is problematic as well. Obamacare is a great idea, but it's opposed by lots of Americans purely because Obama, Obama supported it. One of the reasons we're unlikely to see a cap and trade in the second term is Republicans can't let him solve the healthcare problem and the global warming problem. That's too much of a legacy for the Democrats to have. We think that there's an extent to which because of the partisan nature of politics means that you're always stifling the, the process of legitimation and justification that the other side could bring up. The other huge impact on that process was corruption, which we said wasn't just about donations in this debate, but was also about manipulating the public to undermine the informational processes you said that underwrote democracy. And the opposition, the uh, 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 opening opposition, they said, well, ah, uh, um, donations are undemocratic, so we would just get rid of those, which is weird for a team that thought that democracy should coordinate and decide all issues, but apparently campaign finance was one that should be beyond and above democratic consensus. We think that this, the, the campaign finance laws have failed manifestly around the world because they are themselves the subject of political lobbying from corporations. We give the example of Canada, which tried to stop corporate donations don uh, donating, of, uh, donating above a limit, and those corporations just got their employees to donate. That would be okay in a system if we weren't dealing with something that imperiled our existence right now. The opposition then said, in a point of information, but what if you just created like some college called the you know, Exxon Mobil College of Science and created all these scientists? I'm on your side, you need like a few scientists in order to manipulate people. This would require a lot of scientists to outweigh all of these scientists with science degrees who don't want their children to be underwater in the world right now that are persuaded by science. That was lunacy from the closing opposition. Then they said, well, you know, what about this? budget that is, you know, that they could just reduce. As I've already explained to you, there are measures like the carbon tax, uh, like carbon taxes, that are revenue neutral uh, that are in the constraints of this debate. The opening opposition said we were like somehow changing the motion by having them set general budgetary constraints. That's in the topic that was written by Eric. Like, this motion is about the idea that, that we'd have general budgetary constraints established and we'd work within that. The opposition, closing opposition, said, well, well why, how do we let people pick between wind farms and solar power? Well, instead of a carbon tax, create a, a trading scheme. Let the market decide between those two things. There's no reason why these scientists have to centrally plan each and every way we'll combat global warming. The point is, is they're gonna get a quick, global, effective solution that will arrest the terminal decline of the entire human race. Right, so when it's a benefit for our side, it makes our case incredibly persuasive, which is precisely why we're willing to propose. I thank that speaker very much for his remarks. And now this has a very pleasing welcome to the final speaker of the debate, the opposition whip. Hear, here. here.
So the problem that we got from the um, US government, from government is that they weren't behaving like our comparison was all or nothing. Do something with experts and save the world or do absolutely bubble all because we're all selfish. That is not the comparison. The trade-offs that we are talking about, opening legitimately talked about healthcare versus environment. Ashish more specifically talked about the actual trade-offs that we're going to get in this debate, which is we need to do something about the environment. People are by and large on board. The question is what? Because different environmental policies have different impacts on different peoples. The question isn't screw future generations and save ourselves or save the world and you know experts will be the ones to do it. The question is how quickly are we going to do it? In what ways? Who's going to be the ones to make the sacrifices? Who's going to take the hits? And how much are we willing to sacrifice for future generations in a way that's not completely expensive of ourselves? You need to have that discussion with those people. There's only so much individuals can take. Um, but to clear up, no thanks, to clear up a couple of things. Firstly, like you do actually need money to implement a carbon tax. Like that, you know, you need lawyers and people that can enforce these things. Even if you don't, right, that will be the only thing you pass before they then shut down this thing because they give it no other money. Like if, if you are talking about the global crisis that we all see in front of us, you're going to need more than a carbon tax. Secondly, what's the difference between rights that you were talking about? You're saying, well, look, we protect rights, for example, against racism. That is completely different. Why? Because it's way less complex. The discussion that we're having that Ashish brings you on our side of the house is there is a genuine trade-off between rights between myself and other people that exist now. There's a genuine trade-off between my rights and rights of future people. If you're a racist, you're just a twat and you should stop doing that. That's very morally simplistic, right? It's not a trade-off of interest. Just stop beating people up. So my three points in summary are going to be, um, no thanks, why it's important to have multi-views um, you're not going to um, Secondly, discussion. And thirdly, this panel that you want to talk about that was so ludicrous to talk about. So firstly, opening opposition is absolutely correct when they say there is a legitimate discussion to have about healthcare trade-offs and what we're going to do for the environment. That is perfectly reasonable. I'm not sure why I have an obligation to other people or people ahead of us. Even insofar as we do have an obligation, and like people by and large kind of think it would be nice to be nice. So we're starting to be nice, right? We're starting to be persuaded. But there's still a genuine question to discuss about what trade-offs we're doing. This is the nuanced analysis that Ashish brings you that is completely unresponded to and he used the word crisis a lot. The reason why these trade-offs matter is because there are some policies. Freddie tells us, I ask him, no thanks, I ask him, what policies is this going to be enacting? Well, he says, obviously, the non-controversial ones. Do you mean the non-controversial ones that we're already implementing under the status quo? The point of this, um, the point of this panel is that it's going to have to implement controversial policies, right? That's the very point of this panel. But the reason why they're controversial is because they do do stuff like hurt people, right? Anti-environmental uh, policies disproportionately hurt the poor. One, because they're easy to target. But two, because they do stuff like rely on cars a lot more. Therefore, there's a genuine political and moral discussion to be had about how quickly we deal with that kind of thing. Are there ways that we can help them out? Are there sacrifices that they're prepared to make and not others? It's therefore legitimate to have that discussion with them. But secondly, it's also possible to consult experts on our side of the house, right? It's also possible to inform people to a greater extent. No, thank you. But these guys want to talk about the transnational nature of environmental policies. That's absolutely true. It's unclear why that gets solved on your side of the house. Insofar as now, you just give government a get out when a poorer country comes to them and says, within their IR policy or within in their international economic policy, you guys are polluting our waters. And they can be like, well, whoops, sorry, not us that decides, right? There's now no political pressure that poorer nations can apply on you know, America or England because the government can just wipe their hands of it and say, well, we can't have this discussion in this meeting because that's not us. That's the panel of our experts. No, thank you. Which leads me on to my second point about discussion. Because America does not take kindly to uh, government telling them what to do, as I've realized in all of the debates that I've been in today. Um, and you now add to their conspiracy theory, right? You now, you, like, you legitimize the conspiracy theory that they have, that it's just experts talking down to you who don't care about your feelings, right? They don't care about your individual rights. I want to drive my car. 
Like, you have legitimized that viewpoint. You now give it a lot more narrative. We are getting to a point within political discussion where even the right wing is starting to concede that there are trade, like, that there is an environmental problem. The question is, what do we do about it? No, thank you. So you make the anti-environment lobby much, much louder. Um, I can't even read my notes. Yeah, right. Here. We agree that environmental policy <laughs> involves lots of internal trade-offs. We told you that ill-informed partisan hacks with a literally fatally limited mandate are in a worse position to make those adjudications than experts, and that as with central banking, in that instance, we should defer to the latter. Why do you refuse to address that comparative? Refuse to address the comparative of like political incentives. Because the point is, every single person has incentives, right? Okay, fine, last point. So you guys talk about the panel, and I love how Chris just handed this off to Daniel and then he did his best. So firstly, like it is, <laughs> sorry, that's me. Um, it, 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 if you guys want to talk about corruption within the system, it is still possible to corrupt panels, the panelists, no thank you, it is still possible to corrupt experts. Opie yes. tells you why they will hamstring this panel so that it can literally do nothing with no money. Even if it doesn't, right, let's assume it doesn't. They put in their policy, which was ultimately flawed, that you're going to be doing it on the basis of consensus. So you're going to be, do uh, sorry, you're going to be doing it in order to like match up along representative viewpoints, so you'll have as much of each viewpoint as there is in society. They then said, yeah, but we're not going to invent Exxon Mobile College and have fake scientists, guys. These scientists exist. Chris tells you about them in his speech. Chris tells you about the increasing number of anti-environmental scientists that are denying the impact of climate change. He actually tells you this himself, supporting my case, well, our case. Um, the, the point is, is it's not, firstly, it is possible to have scientists that deny climate change flat out. Secondly, it's possible to have scientists that deny the severity of climate change. And thirdly, it's possible to have scientists who say, no, the issue isn't big business and factories, right? The issue is people flying airplanes, so maybe it would be nicer if people didn't drive their cars. Big business, that's not the issue. So it's not a case that it's just climate change or not. It's a case that you're now going to fund massive amounts of research that already exists, projects that already exist, so you start to change the consensus to the anti-climate change consensus that Chris already tells us is happening because Fox News doesn't like to be told that experts are in control. For these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, we beg to oppose.